Thank you. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, great. So today I'll be talking about some of the principles and tools from my, my new books, as book, as Bianca explained. Um, uh, and I'll be talking about how vegans can create uh, healthy relationships and communicate effectively. Now, I wrote this new book. Um, I'm also, a lot of people don't know this about me, but I've also been a relationship coach for a long time. Um, and as a, a professional vegan who's been traveling around the world for about six years now, talking with thousands and thousands of vegans and also vegetarians and the non-vegans that they're in relationships with sometimes as well, I came to realize that many vegans all over the world, from Latvia to South Africa, were experiencing the same thing. So many people were finding that, you know, it's really empowering, you guys can probably, probably relate, that becoming vegan was one of the most empowering experiences of their lives. And they felt just incredible about this transformation, this personal transformation they experienced. And yet, when they would go home or go back to their lives and share what they had learned and share this change with the people in their lives, their enthusiasm quickly turned to shock and horror. They discovered that so many of their relationships and communication started to break down. So I'm just curious, how many of you guys can relate to this? How many of you have struggled with, re okay, so that's like 99.9, .9, oh, 100%. Um, so I'm just curious from you, what are some of the most common problems? You can just shout them out. Like, what are some of the most common problems you've experienced either in your relationships or in your communications as a vegan? Not feeling heard, right? Like you say the same thing 30 different ways and it still doesn't sink in? What's another example? Okay, so being told that you make your choices, I'll make mine. Leave me alone, don't, don't talk about your veganism to me. What else? Apathy, right? So you kind of ex expect that you're gonna go home and you're gonna be like, hey, guess what I learned? And it's just gonna be a no-brainer. Other people will say, oh. Thank you for informing me, informing me. I'll never eat another bite of meat, eggs, or dairy again. And as we know, this doesn't always happen. Now, studies have shown, research have sh has shown that people who have fulfilling, connected relationships fare better in every aspect of life. They're happier, they're healthier at reduced risk for a variety of diseases, they live longer, and they even have greater career success. So you can just imagine the impact of the absence of fulfilling connected relationships on our lives. And then imagine the impact of the presence of disrupted relationships. So this problem in relationship and communication breakdown comes at a great cost. It comes at a cost to us as individuals, as vegans, um, and also many vegetarians, it, which is surprising to a lot of vegans, experience something very similar. This comes at a cost to us as vegans personally, and it also comes at a cost to the movement as a whole. Vegans are the engine of the movement. And when our relationships are disrupted, we can end up drained and frustrated, um, feeling misanthropic. Do you guys know what that word means? Like, hating humans? <laughs> but you can't relate to that, right? Nobody in this room. Um, and we're less effective ambassadors for the cause. We're engines for the movement, and a tremendous amount of our energy is being siphoned off as we become exhausted and frustrated trying to navigate these complicated relationships and trying to communicate when communication can feel almost impossible. Can you guys relate to some of this? So there is good news, though. Relationship and communication breakdown is not inevitable. And it's also reversible. And in fact, relationships can be repaired and they can even be strengthened to beyond what they had been before. And I'm talking here about all kinds of relationships. Relationships with you know, your romantic partner, but also with friends, family, your relationship with yourself, and also relationships between vegans, vegan-vegan relationships. The principles that I'm gonna talk about today apply to all kinds of relationships. 
So let's talk about what causes relationship and communication breakdown in the first place. Well, for one, we just have limited education about how to have healthy relationships and how to communicate effectively. I am constantly amazed that we spend our entire lives, we have to learn like complicated geometry that we may never use, and we never get a single lesson on how to have a healthy relationship and how to communicate effectively. So this is a problem that affects all people, not just vegans in relationships. Another problem is that this veg, non-veg difference, carnism, the psychology of eating animals, essentially, I'll talk about that briefly later, creates added stress. So here we have no education in how to have healthy relationships. So even relationships between people who share the same ideology not always easy. And then we have this ideological difference thrown into the mix. And this ideological difference is inherently problematic in the way that it impacts people's perceptions of eating or not eating animals. And a third reason is just being vegan can create its own stress. Being vegan in a non-vegan world, in a dominant animal eating culture, is incredibly empowering and it's also incredibly challenging and it impacts us psychologically in ways that many of us are not aware of. So what I'll talk about today are a handful of principles and also some specific tips for improving all kinds of relationships and communication. And underneath, just one point to remember before we get started, is to remember that underneath our ideologies, our different ideologies, whether it's veganism, carnism, or different ideologies within the vegan movement itself, underneath the different ideologies, on a deeper level, is a relationship between people. And this is where our attention needs to be if we're going to have healthy relationships and effective communication. We need to take our attention to begin with out of the content area of our differences, what we believe, and bring it to the way that we relate to and communicate with other human beings. So principle one is to keep your relation relate sorry, relational immune system strong or resilient. Resilience is the ability to bounce back from, to withstand and bounce back from stress. Healthy relationships are like healthy bodies. They thrive when their immune system is stronger than the germs that challenge them. Does that make sense? So the recipe for a healthy relationship is to keep our immune system resilient, to keep our immune system strong, and to learn how to identify and manage the external stressors, the germs that challenge it. And this is what we'll be talking about, I'll be talking about today. Now, a healthy relational immune system is secure and connected. These are the two kind of core issues or uh, things that we need to do to keep our relational immune system strong. We need to feel secure and we need to feel connected. Security and connection exist like most things, maybe everything in life, on a spectrum. So your relationship can be more or less secure and connected. Now, relationships are all about needs. Not to oversimplify, but it actually kind of is that simple. We're happy and we feel connected in general in relationships when our needs are being met and we're not happy and we usually feel disconnected when our needs are not being met. The bottom line need of needs is the need for safety or security. All of us need to feel safe and secure when we're in a relationship with another individual no matter how close that relationship is. The closer the relationship, the greater the need for security, obviously. This can be an incredible challenge for vegans in relationship or simply relating to non-vegans. Traumatic triggers, things that remind us of the trauma, the atrocity that is carnism, are literally everywhere. So while it's important for all of us to commit to the security of the people that we're in relationship with, I need to commit to the security of my family, who some of whom are, are non-vegans, obviously, um, it is 
especially important for vegans to be able to communicate about this need for security because the playing field is not level. Most people don't realize that when they sit down in front of us as vegans, eating animals in front of us can actually cause us to feel insecure or unsafe. How many of you can relate to that? And people don't realize that when they're not vegan, because they're not looking at the world through the same eyes as we are. So one tip is to identify your own boundaries and articulate them. Know where your boundaries are. For some people, for example, they can be in a relationship with a non-vegan as long as they're never exposed to that person eating animals. For other people, they can sit across from some people eating animals. It's very important to know what you need in order to feel safe and to be able to articulate that. Now, the challenge is sometimes that when we talk about what we need, people respond with defensiveness. In my book, I have some uh, suggestions for how to request that people honor our need for safety. And here's one example. Can you see this, or should I read it out to you? Read it. OK, let me try to do that. So. You can say, now you could modify this any, any way you want. When I look at meat, eggs, and dairy, as much as I try not to, I can't help but see dead animals' bodies. I can't help but have flashbacks to the horrible videos I've seen about how those animals were raised and killed, and I automatically feel horrified. So you're not trying to turn the person vegan. You're simply sharing with this person in your life what the world looks like through your eyes so they can understand your experience. This is probably how you'd feel if the meat, eggs, and dairy came from dogs and cats. I'm not asking you to become vegan, but just to understand my experience so you understand why it's so important to me not to be exposed to animal products. Now, you know, a lot of times when we talk about veganism to non-vegans, the people in our lives get defensive, partly because these defenses are built in psychologically, but also partly because they think we're trying to convert them. Relationships in general are not a forum for advocacy. Advocacy is complicated in relationships. We'll talk about that in a few minutes, but you guys, I think, know what I'm talking about. But we all have a need to feel like the other person, the person we're in a relationship, understands our experience. And all of us need and deserve to have our boundaries respected. So we all need to essentially be compassionately witnessed. Compassionately, compassionate witnessing is seeing with our eyes and minds as well as our heart, is seeing the other person, the other's experience without judging it. One of, uh, a very painful experience for many vegans is feeling invisible in relationships, feeling unseen. Often for us, one of the most important, maybe the most important aspect of our lives, what we're most impassioned about, what we're most proud of, what upsets us the most is invisible to the people around us. We have to stuff away or hide this fundamental part of ourselves. We have to shrink ourselves to fit into the relationships in our lives. We all need, in relationships, everybody needs and deserves to have their inner world understood and seen. Everybody needs to be compassionately witnessed. The only exception is when somebody is asking you to witness them, when what they're asking you to witness violates your integrity or makes you feel unsafe or insecure. How many of you can relate to this feeling of just being invisible in your lives and your relationships? It's very challenging, and it's impossible to feel connected when we feel so invisible. And the culture at large doesn't witness vegans. Our experience is invisible at best and misrepresented often. So one way you can ask for compassionate witnessing is to say something like this. Let me see if I can see. So you can say something like, as you know, being vegan is an incredibly important part of who I am. Vegan beliefs and values are central to my life. If I feel like you don't understand this major area of my life, I feel unseen and like I can't really be my authentic self with you. Like I have to keep parts of myself out of our relationship. So I end up feeling less connected with you than I want to be. So here again, you're not saying I'm trying to turn you vegan. You're saying I want to feel more connected with you. And I can't if I feel like you don't understand me. 
because I want to feel more connected with you, I want to be able to share information about veganism with you. Not to try to change you or make you vegan, but so you can understand me. Basically, I need to know that you know what the world looks like through my eyes. And that's only possible if you understand enough about veganism and what it means to be vegan. And by enough, I mean sufficiently for me to feel that you really get the issue, that you really get me. Now, you know, people might respond to these requests and be like, screw you. That's important information for you to have about that relationship in your life. If you are asking somebody to simply empathize with you and look at the world through your eyes and understand your inner world, and your motivation is so that they understand you, so that you can feel closer to them, maybe that you can feel more respected by them, and they say no, that's important information about that relationship. Maybe you need to have more distance in that relationship with the other person. At this, in, in any case, it is useful to be able to at least know what you want, know what you need, and be able to feel like you have the right to ask for it. And it's also important for us to request that people in our lives become what I call vegan allies. Some of you might have heard me talk about vegan allies before. Everybody in relationship needs to be an ally to the person they're with. We all need to know that the other person has our back, right? That they're on our side. It's especially important when there's an imbalance of power in a relationship, which is true when one person is a member of a non-dominant group, like vegans, and the other person is not. So a vegan ally is a person who supports veganism and supports vegans, but isn't fully vegan yet themselves. Now, a lot of times vegans understandably, but, but problematically, frame the issue and say, you know, either you're, you're vegan and you're part of the solution, or you're not vegan, and what? You're part of the problem. Given that I think it's like less than 1% of the global population is vegan, um, we are alienating like 99% of the public. Some of the people who have done the most for veganism and animals are not vegan. In my life, I mean, I can say a lot, virtually all of the journalists who interview me and publish articles that sometimes reach hundreds of thousands, even millions of readers, are not vegan. People who donate to Beyond Carnism to my organization are sometimes not vegan. For whatever reason, they're not ready to be vegan yet themselves. And if we give them an opportunity to be a part of the solution, whatever way they can, we give them an opportunity to help animals, help that the other animals might not otherwise get. And so we need, for many people in relationships with non-vegans are frustrated, not just because that person isn't vegan, but because that person isn't a vegan ally. We don't feel like they're on our side. Our side. So here's one example of how, um, this is my last example, of how you can ask for a vegan ally, somebody to become a vegan ally in your life. I have all of these um, scripts in my book, so you can actually just photocopy them and send them to somebody if you want, or... <laughs> reword them. In my book, I also have a letter, Dear Non-Vegan, um, that explains the experience of what it is to be vegan and what would be helpful for that person to understand so that vegans feel more witnessed and more, more secure and connected. One thing that would, would reduce my stress a lot is knowing that even if the rest of the world doesn't understand veganism or me, you do. I'm not asking you to be vegan. I'm just asking you to understand my world so I don't feel so alone. I need to know you're my ally, that you of all people see me and that you have my back, especially when things are tough. I, sh I shorten this. Um, you already do this for me in so many ways. It's easier to ask for somebody to be an ally if we give them an example of what an ally looks like in other ways. Uh, so even though you're not vegan, I need to know you understand what veganism is, what it means to me, and what it's like for me to live as a vegan in a non-vegan world. What I think would be most helpful is to be able to share information about veganism with you. And it would also be really helpful for me to be able to talk to you about my experience as a vegan when I need to, just like I can talk to you about other things in my life. 
So often, as I said, um, people can navigate relationships and actually feel very connected with people in their lives who are not vegan as long as they know that that non-vegan gets them and is an ally. Some of the people in my family still eat animals, um, but they don't judge me. They stand by me. If we go out to a restaurant, they're really careful about where we go. They don't have animal foods on the table for the most part. Well, now they don't do it anymore, but for a long time, for the most part, they did. And if they had meat on the table, it would be in the other, you know, separate from me. Um, and it makes a very big difference. It's a statement saying, I see you, I get you. A lot of times we as vegans feel like, oh, it's not working. I can't have a relationship with somebody who's not vegan. It's just too hard. But really what's hard is feeling disrespected and unseen and unwitnessed. Okay, so this brings us to principle two, which is to let integrity be your guide. Integrity is the, the north star of security and connection. To the degree that we practice integrity in our interactions is the degree to which our relationships, including our relationship with ourselves, is more secure and connected. So integrity is essentially the, um, the, the integration of core moral values and practices. And so one tip is to commit to the best of your ability, you don't have to be perfectionistic about this, um, to practicing the three C's, what I call the three C's of integrity, curiosity, compassion, and courage. Curiosity is having an open mind, compassion is having an open heart, and courage is having the courage to keep your mind and your heart open, because it's not that easy to do. Even if other people in your life, non-vegans and vegans, are not willing to do this, you can still do this. And if you commit to practicing integrity, and you find that the people around you continue to not respond and interact with integrity, then that's important information for you to have about those relationships. Now, the most important, probably, aspect of practicing integrity is that it helps us to avoid judging and shaming. And I want to just pause here and talk a little bit about shame and judgment, because they're so crucial to healthy relationships, healthy communication, and to creating an empowered and effective vegan movement. Now, how would you, des how would you define shame? What, is sh what comes to mind when you hear the word shame? It's similar to embarrassment. How is shame different from guilt? Yeah, well, some t shame, both of them can be about how people see you. We often use shame and guilt interchangeably, but they're not the same. Mm -hmm. um, you're very close, right? So guilt is when we feel like we, how we feel when we've done something bad. Guilt is the feeling of, I've done something bad. It's about a behavior. Shame is how we feel about ourselves. Guilt is, I did something bad. Shame is, I am bad. You get the difference? Shame is the feeling of being less than. More specifically, it's the feeling of being less worthy than. Shame is such a disruptive emotion. It is probably the most dysfunctional and problematic emotion that exists in the entire repertoire of emotions. Shame is so disruptive to our sense of self that most of us will do just about anything to avoid feeling this way. And we live, unfortunately, in a dominant culture where shaming is normal. Shaming is so normal and so normalized, we don't even notice it when it's happening because it's part of our everyday communication. And I'm not just talking about Facebook. Most of us carry around a lot of shame inside of ourselves. All of us carry some shame. It's just a matter of the degree to which we feel it, we, we have it. And all of us are defended against feeling more shame. Nobody wants to feel shame. I always say that the best way to get somebody to do the opposite of what we want them to do is to shame them. 
Shamed people wrap themselves in the emotional armor necessary to protect themselves from further shaming. Shamed people withdraw or attack. Shamed people are not people who feel like they have the agency to take positive action on their own and others' behalf. Shaming is the kryptonite of relationships and communication, and I would suggest that shaming is also the kryptonite of the vegan movement. Now, have you noticed how some of our outreach is framed? A lot of the way that we communicate with non-vegans is shaming. And we believe that we'll, if we shame people, we'll motivate them to change. Unfortunately, very often, the opposite is true. Judgment is the counterpart, the mental counterpart, the mental counterpart to shame. When we judge somebody, we're essentially taking a position of superiority, or ourselves. We judge ourselves too. When we judge somebody, we're looking down on them. It could be minimal, or it could be, you know, significant. Either way, you know what it feels like to be on the receiving end of judgment, right? We all look at ourselves through each other's eyes. When you look at yourself through the eyes of somebody who's judging you, how do you feel? You typically feel ashamed. Now that shame might quickly turn to anger, a defensive em emotion to protect against further shame, um, but we feel inferior. Judgment is, when we are in judgment of somebody else, we are putting ourselves in a position of superiority and putting them in a position of inferiority. We cannot feel secure and connected in a relationship or even in an interaction when we feel the other person is judging us. So integrity is a guide, it's a roadmap. The more we practice integrity, curiosity, compassion, empathy for others, the less likely we are to judge and shame them. And I'll come back to this later. The degree to which our relationship reflects integrity is the degree to which our relationship is secure and connected. So the number one thing that we can do for the movement as vegans, and I'll talk about this in a minute, um, and for ourselves and our relationships is to commit to practicing greater empathy. Empathy is very often the antidote to judgment. It's hard to stand in judgment of somebody if we're looking at the world through their eyes. Now, shaming is a huge problem among vegans. How many of you have noticed this? Just a little bit. We, um, and, and this, in my opinion, is one of the most damaging things that we can do in the vegan movement. I can give you just one example of many from Facebook. Can you see this? Somebody wrote recently about, I don't know, this is a response, a comment response. That perspective doesn't help the animals one damn bit. You're okay with consuming honey, backyard eggs, wearing animal skins as long as they were purchased before you were vegan. So fucking pathetic. If you truly cared about the animals, you'd adhere to the true definition of veganism. And we hear this all the time. What we don't realize is that the damage that this does, this chips away at the heart, this chips away at the resilience of vegans who are already living in a world that every single day is offending their deepest sensibilities. They're deepest values. It takes a lot of courage to live in this world as a vegan in this movement that's so young, to go home to our families, to go out into the world and be told that we're crazy, that we're overreactive, that we're hypersensitive. And then when we have other vegans shaming us, it can feel, I have seen many vegans give up and just leave the movement because it just felt like it was too much. It's almost like, you know, like, if we're, if we're you know, rowing a lifeboat with rescued farmed animals in it, shaming vegans is like drilling a hole in the bottom of that lifeboat, siphoning out the energy that we need. When we harm other vegans, we harm animals. We can have a difference of opinion. Difference of opinion matters. It's important. Conversations need to happen about different ideologies and different strategies. And we can also do that from a place of integrity that helps us grow and become more empowered, that doesn't shrink us down and beat us down. And vegans are often very conscientious people 
who are very sensitive to not causing harm to others. So then when we trigger that sensitivity, you can imagine what that does um, to that individual who's on the receiving end of it. So principle three is to learn effective communication. I have an entire chapter in my books just specifically on effective communication. Effective communication is a set of skills and tools and principles that can be learned by anybody who's really committed to doing so. And I'm going to give you just a few tips about effective communication today. So one is to focus more on the process than the content of a communication. Communications all have these two parts, content and process. The content of the communication is what? It's the information, right? The content is what we're talking about, right? Veganism, for example, is content. The process of the communication is how we are communicating. So you get that difference? What versus how. So studies have shown that in communications, people tend to remember far more of one of these than the other. What do you think it is? They remember the process, right? Like, think about your own life. Um, you know, think about a conversation that you had maybe yesterday or two weeks ago or a year ago. You might have forgotten all of the content. You don't even remember what you, talk, what you talked about. But chances are, you remember how you felt in that conversation, right? That's the process. The, proce the content matters. The process matters far more. And a healthy process looks exactly the same no matter what we're talking about. In a healthy process, our goal is mutual understanding. Communication is what we have to use because we don't have telepathy. Communication is the bridge between ourselves and others. We communicate so that the other understands our thoughts and our feelings and vice versa. So when we have a healthy, healthy process, our goal is mutual understanding. It's to understand and be understood. Our goal is not to be right. If our goal is to be right, what does that mean about the other person? We're making them wrong. Generally, that's not an effective way to advocate, and it certainly is not uh, an effective way to have a healthy, you know, a secure and connected relationship. So it's important for us to avoid debating ideas. The debate model works in very rare circumstances. It works in courtrooms. Um, it works in some, you know, political debates. But in a debate, the goal is to win, which makes the other person what? Lose. This is not a recipe for healthy relating. This is dis d the debate model is inherently disconnecting. So when we have a healthy process, we commit to being curious and compassionate, to understanding the other, and to be understood. This doesn't mean we accept disrespect. On the contrary, we're committed to respect. Now, when we have a healthy process, one of the key things that we don't do is we don't define reality. Defining reality, when we define reality, we appoint ourselves the expert on the other's experience, even if what they say contradicts us. Oh, I know what you're thinking and feeling, even if you tell me I'm wrong. I know what's really going on inside of you. We cannot possibly know what's happening inside another person. We simply can't. Even psychologists don't. Um, when we allow the other person to be an expert on their experience, we give them a great gift, and we significantly reduce defensiveness. Defining reality is the foundation of dysfunction, of much of the dysfunction in communications. It's, it's so normalized, we do it all the time, and we often don't realize it when we're doing it. Um, you know, when I said earlier, we look at the world through each other's eyes. We look at ourselves through each other's eyes all the time. So if I'm saying something, or let me just give you an example, actually, of defining reality. If a child says to their parent um, after dinner, oh, I'm hungry, and the parent says, well, no, you aren't. You just ate. 
that's defining the child's reality. That is teaching the child not to trust the signals their body is giving them or the signals their feelings are giving them and to believe somebody else's version of reality over their own. Now, um, let me give you one example of how vegans define reality. So a non-vegan says, oh, I love animals. You know where I'm going, right? Oh, you don't? You eat them. Now, I hear this all the time. People talking to me, a lot of my conversations happen on airplanes. Um, you know, they'll see like the title of my book, oh, why we love dogs, eat pigs, and wear cows. Oh, I love dogs. I love animals. You know, and I see this as an opportunity for a conversation. Another way to respond to this is to say, you know, that's good to hear. The animals in this world have a really hard time, and they need all the compassion they can get. I care about animals too. That's actually what led me to eventually become vegan. So you're watering the right seeds. You're focusing on the part of the person you want to grow. You love animals? That's great. Tell me about it. I had a conversation with a woman on a plane who said, I love dogs. And I said, is it, is it only dogs or do you love all? I love all animals. And she was actually eating chicken while she was talking to me. And, and I said, really, you know, tell me about that, you know? So, so what does that look like? Do you, do you like rescue animals? Oh my God, I was always the kid that like would stop and, and she, you know, help the hurt bird on the side of the road. Like, you know, and I said, I said, that's like the world needs more compassion for animals. I said, me too. You know, that's why I wrote my book. It's actually why I became vegetarian. Um, and at the end of this conversation, she was asking me for, for vegan recipes. So water the right seeds. You know, you could also say, well, what kind of animals they love? Um, just open up the conversation, but don't define reality. Here's another example. Vegan One says, I want to create a vegan world. And Vegan 2 says, no, you don't. Even though you produced movies that changed millions of people's views on eating animals and dedicated your life to the cause, you use non-vegan soap, so you're a hypocritical animal murderer. <laughs> so, you know, like, we hear this all the time. <laughs> okay, so principle... Um, Four is to identify the germ of carnism. So I talked about earlier about you know a healthier a healthy uh, relationship has a strong immune system and it can identify and challenge the germs that that attack it. So one key germ in vegan non-vegan relationships is the germ of carnism. A lot of you are familiar with my work on carnism here. I'm not going to go into that in any great detail. I, I do a little bit more in my book, but carnism is the psycho basically the mentality that conditions people to eat certain animals and it's organized around defenses and distortions about meat, eggs, dairy and farmed animals and also about vegans. So often, you know, when we're talking to somebody who's not vegan, they've internalized carnism so much that they're, you know, all you have to do is say, I'm vegan, and you get, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? This like, oh my God. Um, the defensiveness comes up right away. So we really need to understand carnism. And in my book, I talk about how, how carnism is like a third wheel in the relationship. Carnism triangulates relationships. Do you guys know what triangulate means? So it's a, it's a term that is often used by um, uh, couples, like relationship psychotherapists. So a tr something that triangulates relationships is a third element that disrupts a relationship of two people. It doesn't even have to be an intimate relationship, any relationship. So if two people are in a relationship and one person starts having an affair or develops an addiction or an in-law becomes intrusive or something, that changes the dynamic between those two people. So it's a relationship between person A, person B, and the third disrupting element. So one way to think of this is to think of carnism as a disrupting element in the relationship. And instead of it's you against the non-vegan, it's you and the non-vegan united against carnism that's working to create problems in your relationship. Both of you probably want to be secure and connected and happy together. So this framing can make it easier to talk about the issue and, and manage the issue. Now, 
Carnism, you know, we have to recognize these carnistic defenses because they, they create massive distortions in people's perceptions. Um, if you don't, aren't familiar with my work on carnistic defenses, um, I write about them somewhat in this book, and also you can just go to carnism.org for information, more information about it. Um, one tip I want to talk about today um, that can be really helpful is to recognize how carnism distorts perceptions of needs so that... Neutral requests are perceived as unfair demands. Vegans often don't recognize this. Vegans end up apologizing for inconveniencing people because they asked maybe, could you please keep the cheese on the side? I'm so sorry. Thank you so much for going out of your way for me. Um, you know, so for example, the vegan might say something like this. Would you please keep the cheese on the side of the salad so I can eat some too? But be perceived like this. You better not put any cheese in that salad of yours and go vegan, you lousy meat-eating hypocrite. And so the way that people respond to vegan requests are often the result of this distortion, this carnistic distortion of vegans' needs. And being aware of this can help to offset that somewhat. Now, a side effect or a byproduct of carnism is um, secondary traumatic stress. And some of you, I think, have heard of this. Last year on the stage, I gave a talk all about secondary traumatic stress. Um, secondary traumatic stress is just like post-traumatic stress. You guys have heard of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, right? But there's only one difference. What do you think it is? Secondary traumatic stress, so post-traumatic, <coughs> excuse me, post-traumatic stress affects the direct victims of violence. Secondary traumatic stress affects who? The witnesses to violence. Who are those witnesses to violence? Us, vegans. We live in the midst of a global atrocity. The extent of the suffering is unfathomable to most people, even to those of us who are aware of it. We are surrounded by trauma, and we are reminded of this, even if we don't go on Facebook and watch those horrible videos, which I recommend you don't, um, we are surrounded by this trauma. Every single day, we're surrounded by the reminders of it. Many vegans are traumatized from what we have seen. And it makes sense, it's a normal reaction to witnessing trauma, is to develop secondary traumatic stress. This is one reason I recommend, number one, not shocking people with traumatic material, because when you shock people with traumatic material, you can traumatize them if they haven't given their consent or if they haven't been prepared for it, and then they see you as the bad guy, the perpetrator, instead of as somebody who's just trying to raise awareness, and pr to protect yourself from this traumatization. There's no need, if you're, already, if you're already aware of what's going on, there's no need to feed the traumatized part of yourself. Trauma is sort of like an entity that wants to keep itself alive in us. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the symptoms of secondary trauma, and then it might make more sense. So when we have trauma or, or secondary traumatization, we can experience, for example, emotional dysregulation. That means we might feel too much, or we might not feel enough, we're numbed out, or we might swing between the extremes of these two things. We can feel like our efforts are never enough. It's just keep going and going and going, having trouble, having fun, because we think about what's happening to the animals. Can anyone relate to some of this? Probably a lot of people here can, right? We can have intrusive thoughts. These are thoughts that come into our mind, intrude in our minds when we're not expecting them, when we're not wanting them. They're like flashbacks of, of the suffering that we've seen. We can feel guilty for feeling good, so we never allow ourselves to actually relax and have a good time. And of course, we become more and more misanthropic. Um, I know many vegans who are, are, you know, experiencing a fairly high degree of trauma and traumatization, and yet they continue to feed the trauma. And in part, that's because the trauma wants to be fed to keep itself alive. Often vegans are afraid that if they stop feeling the trauma, if they stop feeling that charge 
or the anger that can go along with the trauma. You know, some degree of anger is obviously justified, but a lot of the anger we have in the movement is not healthy or productive anger, and we feed it. And, you know, when, when we do that, a lot of vegans will continue to feed the anger, which makes us not very productive when we're trying to talk about veganism, and feed the trauma. Because we're afraid that if we stop feeling it, we're going to stop working for the animals. And I would suggest that you give yourself permission to let your trauma go. Give yourself permission to not be traumatized. When we come to our activism, when we come to our lives from a place of presence, from a place of compassion and curiosity, which is not possible when, we're ha when we have a lot of trauma in our lives, when we come to our activism from self-connectedness, from security and connection, we bring more effectiveness to our activism, we have more sustainable lives, um, and we are more effective ambassadors for the animals. I have never met a vegan who let their trauma go and stopped being active. It's usually the opposite. They're active, but they're not motivated for the wrong reasons. They're active and they're more effective. Now, when it comes to our relationships and also communication, um, one thing that's really important to recognize is what I refer to in my book as the, the trauma narrative. So what happens when we're traumatized is that we can start to see the world as one giant traumatic event. So in our mind, we start looking at the world through the lens of trauma. And we divide everybody in the world in the world, sorry, in the world into these three different categories. You're either a victim, or you're a perpetrator, or you're a hero. And there's no gray area in between. And we tend to exaggerate these roles as well. We exaggerate the impact of so-called perpetrators. We exaggerate the impact of so-called heroes. So we put vegans, sometimes famous vegans, on these pedestals and think that they're responsible for saving the world, for saving the animals, you know? The real engine of the movement is the grassroots. The real engine of the movement is the people doing the day-to-day -day work that maybe are not so visible, but they're, that are out there nonetheless. That's where the real numbers are. When we see people as heroes in this way, then we get really afraid they can't screw up at all. And we think, oh my God, this famous vegan was seen eating a piece of fish. It's going to be the downfall of the whole movement. So-and-so is vegan, but they're not vegan anymore. Now there's like Bill Clinton, remember? He, he went kind of vegan-ish, and then he started eating fish. Oh my God, there it is. The movement's going down. Um, what happens in our relationships is that, you know, we, when we see people as perpetrators, for example, because they're not part of the solution, they're not vegan heroes, we can just be, you know, with somebody in our lives who's, you know, unfortunately eating animals, and in our minds, they automatically go from this to this. And we think, you know, and so this person's, you know, contribution to animal suffering in that moment is like 0.0000001%. But in our vegan traumatized minds, it's like, you're the reason those poor pigs in the video this morning went through what they went through. So everything gets exaggerated in our minds, and there's no gray area. We lose nuance. We lose the ability to recognize that good people can participate in harmful practices, and that doesn't make them bad people. We all do. We all do. Nobody belongs on a pedestal. And it doesn't make sense to demonize people, especially when carnism is so normalized. We're so indoctrinated with carnism. We often, you know, fall prey. A lot of this kind of uh, hero worship that we can get into is the result of our own survivor guilt. Many of you may, have you heard of survivor guilt before? Survivor guilt is the guilt that a person feels when they survived a trauma and others perished. So this is really common among uh, veterans of war, uh, people who were in like boating accidents, for example. It's this strong sense of guilt for simply having survived. And a lot of vegans experience this survivor guilt. 
When we don't recognize our own guilt, we won't attend to our own guilt, we manage it in ways that feed the trauma in ourselves and that feed the trauma in the movement. Guilty people tend to try to find other people who are more guilty. So they feel less guilty by comparison. I feel like I'm not doing enough for the animals, but you know what? You just ate a cookie that had honey in it, so you suck. Um, and we also overwork. One way of managing survivor guilt is getting like addictive and compulsively workaholic. Um, and we shame other vegans, and we call other vegans not vegan enough. Um, there's a, this perfectionism plagues the movement. You know, a lot of people suffer from perfectionism. And people who are attracted to a morally grounded or motivated movement like veganism um, tend to be very conscientious people. People who tend to be more perfectionistic, often morally perfectionistic. How many of you can relate to feeling like you're kind of perfectionistic? Just curious. There's a lot of people. That's what I thought. Um, and, you know, it, it's not bad to want to create. I mean, obviously, we want to create a better world. We have a vision of the way the world could be. But perfectionism limits us. It limits us in many ways. When we're perfectionistic, we hold other people to standards that are unrealistic and then get angry at them when they don't meet up to those standards. We do the same thing to ourselves. One of the greatest gifts we can give to ourselves and those with whom we are in relationship is to appreciate our imperfection. Uh, we are all kind of messed up people. We were born into a society, a world that is arguably insane um, in many, many ways. I don't know anybody who's had perfect parenting. If you have, talk to me after, because I want to interview you and meet your parents. Um, and even if our parents were amazing, Hollywood screwed us up. So one way or another, we get messed up. So the question is not like, you know, whether we're messed up. It's like, what kind of messed up are we? Um, if you can give yourselves permission to be your imperfect, messy, complicated, screwed up self, if you can embrace the imperfection in you and see that it's the imperfect, messy parts of you that make you beautiful, that's where our beauty lies, not in the shiny exterior of perfect moralism or whatever we want to project to the world, but in our authentic humanity in some ways. If you can embrace this part of you, this aspect of you, you give yourself a great gift, and you will bring this gift to the relationships you have with others, because they won't be afraid of being themselves around you. And you open up the opportunities for connection and create deeper security, and it makes people more receptive to what you have to say in the first place. So the most important thing we can do in managing our secondary trauma is to take care of ourselves. We are often, as vegans, we're very much focused on the needs of others, of the animals, of the movement. We're under-focused on our own needs. As I said, People are happy and secure and connected in relationships when their needs are being met, and they're not happy and they're not secure and connected when their needs are not being met. Our primary relationship is with ourselves. If we neglect our own needs, first of all, that's called self-neglect, and when we neglect our own needs, we make ourselves less resilient. The most important thing to do is to recognize and attend to your own needs. This is so important for the vegan movement as a whole because this is what makes us resilient. This is what builds our, I talked about the relational immune system. This is what builds our own internal immune system. Think of it as like a psycho-emotional immune system. The more resilient it is, the less likely we are to get sick, to develop stress, to develop secondary trauma. And I have a whole other talk on this, and it's online at carnism.org if you're interested. Actually, it was filmed here, so it's probably on the IARC's website or, or YouTube channel as well. Commit to taking care of your own needs. And your needs exist psychologically, emotionally, physically. You know, don't say, I know I need to sleep more, and then not sleep for the next six months. Actually, do it. Give yourself permission to do it. Sometimes it's our trauma and our survivor guilt 
that prevents us from attending to our own needs. And so this is like a feedback loop. The more we neglect our needs, the more the trauma takes over. And the more the trauma takes over, the more we want to neglect our own needs. Okay, so the final point, um, the almost final point um, that I'm going to talk about is, is practicing acceptance. Um, acceptance is actually, a, it's a Buddhist concept. It's accepting or not resisting what is. Um, when it comes to our relationships with others, acceptance is a generosity everybody deserves. This does not mean that we accept a violent world and don't try to change it. It's actually the opposite. The more we're in a state of acceptance, the more effective we are at changing the things we don't like. We just come to that change from a healthier place. So when I'm talking about practicing acceptance, I mean accepting another individual for who they are, simply not judging them. You may decide that you can't tolerate being in a relationship with a non-vegan. You might feel fine, you know what, it's just too much for me, I can't do it, that's fine. It doesn't change the fact that, that it's important to accept them for who they are first. You can say to yourself, I accept that this person is not vegan. I am not judging them for not being vegan. And it's not something I can live with. So this is, simply means not judging. And sometimes when we accept others for who they are, they change automatically. Sometimes people resist making changes that they would otherwise make simply because they don't want to change out of having been pushed or pressured. So when we practice acceptance, we don't work so hard to turn the people in our lives vegan. I'm not saying not to advocate veganism. Obviously, we're activists. This is something important to do. However, our relationships are not a forum for advocacy. Advocacy has its place, and it's often not in our, at least in our closer relationships. Um, how many of you feel like you work or have worked? Maybe you gave up really hard to turn the people in your life vegan, right? It's really common, and really, maybe ironically, the people that we're closest to are sometimes the least receptive to our advocacy. Have you noticed this? So, you know, long-standing power struggles sometimes can get in the way. You know, there are these existing relationship dynamics that, that make it more challenging. It's understandable that we want the people closest to us to be vegan because we want to feel more connected, and that's one way that we can do that. And it's, you know, it's understandable that we want to do that. It's just, usually it's not a good use of our time. You know, it's like, I know so many people who are like, oh, you know, if I could just get through to Uncle Ed. You know, I just, I've been working on him for like 15 years. He's a tough nut to crack, but I know there's a heart of gold in there somewhere. If I could just crack through and open up that heart, I will have succeeded. You know, not the most effective use of our time. Um, you know, we really need to let the numbers be our guide. The animals depend on us to be as effective as possible, to let impact be our, gu be our guide. There are, unfortunately, you know, more than seven billion people alive on the planet today. Many of them are not ready to be vegan or to move toward veganism. Many of them are. So a, a good use of our time, instead of spending 15 years on Uncle Ed, take that energy and reach out to the 500,000 people that you haven't reached out to because you were so busy talking to Uncle Ed. Um, so really to go for the low hanging fruit. If I'm talking about veganism to somebody, you know, and I find that you know, early in the conversation they're really not receptive, not a good use of my time. I move on because there are a lot of people that really are receptive. So give yourself permission to love non-vegans even if you don't love what they do. You can love somebody without loving the fact, without even liking the fact that they eat animals. Sometimes vegans suffer the pain of disconnection in their inter-ideological relationships because they feel like if they love a non-vegan, they're somehow selling out. They're somehow giving up. There's never too much love. There is never too much empathy for the world. There's never a good reason not to love someone in my opinion. So sometimes it's just a matter of giving yourself permission to love a non-vegan, even if you don't love what they do. 
And, you know, we can encourage people, if we really want to talk about veganism, to be as vegan as possible. Um, this is generally the way that I talk about veganism, the way I advocate veganism when it comes up in conversation. I, um, I had an interesting conversation uh, a couple of years, no, less, like a year ago. I was on a flight, it was on an airplane, surprise. Um, I was on a long flight back from South Africa to Berlin, and the person sitting next to me was a young Lufthansa pilot. Um, we were on a Lufthansa flight. And we, were, we got to talking, and um, he was a really nice guy, and he, you know, very politically, um, politically aware, and we were having an interesting conversation, and veganism came up. He asked why I had been in South Africa. And um, I told him that I was vegan, and he said, yeah, I used to be vegan. And I said, oh, okay, so why, I didn't say, well, why are you not vegan now? I said, oh, so what, what motivated you to become vegan in the first place? You know, I wanted to, I was curious. Um, what are the right seeds? And he said, animal rights. It was complete, I said, was it health? He said, no, no, no. He said it was completely ethical. Animal rights. And he was a strong supporter of human rights, so I wasn't terribly surprised. And, you know, and he was, as he was telling me, he was very passionate about it. And so then I said, so then, why did you stop being vegan? And he said, you know, as a pilot, it was just impossible. You know, they'll call me last minute, I have to get on a flight, I'm eating carrots if I'm lucky enough to have had them in my refrigerator to bring along. You know, they need like 24 hours or something to get a vegan meal on a plane. That's a whole other talk. Um, but he, it was just not sustainable. And he said, you know, so every once in a while, he would land somewhere, it would be late at night, he'd be starving and he'd have to get like a sandwich that had cheese in it because there was no vegan sandwich. So, so basically like every few weeks he was eating a piece of cheese and because he couldn't call himself vegan, you know, part of this is again like, what is it to be vegan? He figured, well, I'm not vegan, so what's the point? And then he became full on, you know, he, he, he flipped back into full-on carnism. And so as we were talking, I said, so, so that, was, that was it. And I said, well, so, you know, why don't you just try to be as vegan as possible? And he looked at me, he said, well, can I do that? Like, it was like permission. I think you can. And he said, that's a great idea. I mean, he said, well, if I'm as vegan as possible, I could be, I could be like 95, 98% vegan. Is it? So... This is really important for us to remember. This is what Tobias was talking about earlier. If we give people permission to be as vegan as possible, if everyone were as vegan as possible, the world would be vegan quite quickly. Um, and so when we ask people to become as vegan as possible, we're not defining their reality. We're not saying, oh, being vegan is so easy. You can do it, just do it. Start tomorrow and never go back. You know, we're not defining their reality. We're not saying, reduce. You know, this is reductionist, but we're not saying, you know, why don't you just reduce because then reduction becomes an end in and of itself. Being as vegan as possible shows veganism as the ultimate end goal and honors a person's own sustainability. And so even in your relationships, you know, if, if the conversation comes up and you, you talk about vegan allies and, you know, ask, well, what, what does it look like to you to be as vegan as possible? You might find that people are more receptive to be moving a lot closer in the direction of your ideology or lifestyle than, than you had previously believed. Okay, so my final point is to, to honor yourself. Um, this comes back to somewhat to, to taking care of your needs, you know, honor yourself, respect yourself. It is, as I have said, tremendously challenging in many ways. It's incredibly empowering to be vegan in this world, incredibly empowering, incredibly important, and it's also challenging. We have to navigate these complicated relationships and communications, and yet we keep doing it. You know, and, and we're pioneers. This is not for nothing. What we're doing is working. Um, there, no question about it. Veganism is, is growing. Um, you know, I've been in many, many places around the world now, and, you know, I have seen the vegan movement growing everywhere I've gone without exception. I have absolutely no doubt that veganism will replace carnism one day as the dominant ideology. The question in my mind is not whether, it's simply when. And so, 
as we live now, you know, in this day and age, the movement is growing quickly, and it's also still a young movement. So we are pioneers in this movement. It takes a tremendous amount of integrity and a tremendous amount of courage to pave the way for a better future, a better future for other vegans who are not going to need to come to presentations like this um, because they will have become the dominant group, quite likely, and a better future for animals. And so honor yourself, you know, remember change is happening. Change is happening faster than I would have ever expected it, actually. There's a lot to be grateful for. There's a lot to be excited about. And, you know, honor your truth and know that you are a part of something that is it's greater than your individual selves. You are, we are all a part of a social movement that I believe will be looked back upon one day as one of the, if not the, most important and transformative transformational social movements in human history. Remember that and that'll keep your energy, keep your batteries charged as it, as it does for me. So I wanna just wrap up by saying thank you for all that you are and all that you do and for being a true part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you guys. So, you are wonderful. So, um, again, I, my new book goes into this um, much, more, much more thoroughly than I could possibly do justice to in this brief, brief um, talk today. Uh, I don't have, we don't have books here. Um, the shipment got stuck in customs in Germany. So, um, yeah, so there are a whole bunch of books. They just are in the customs office in Berlin. Um, but, but you can, you can, pre-order it now on Amazon. Sorry about that. But um, so I think we have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, yeah. I can't really see, so just point, wave, yeah. Hi. Hi, thank you very much for this very insightful and inspiring talk. Thank you. I have two questions, if I may. The first one is regarding one-to-one uh, -one relationships and talking to the other person. Mm -hmm. So uh, most of them, at least, uh, that's my case. We've grown up into in relationships where we haven't really been taught to talk about them. And so there is a bit of a resistance already to talking about relationships. So talking about veganism and then overcoming the resistance to talking about our feelings in relationships, what are your thoughts on that? Would you recommend when we have that resistance in a relationship? Yeah, let me answer that one yeah. first, okay? okay? So that's a really great question, right? So, so it is, ch you know, a lot of people don't talk about relationships in the first place, um, and that, that's a whole other level of resistance you need to get through. So that's a really great question. Um, you know, what I did in the book was I wrote these, I have a bunch of appendices, right? So you can just take these scripts, and some of them are shorter than the ones that I, I had here, and modify them however you need. You don't even have to frame it as in relationship, right? So, and it's also different in different languages, right? Like, in different cultures. Like, in the U.S., we can use more flowery, effusive language, you know, and in Germany, that doesn't go over so well. Um, so, you really want to just tailor them. Um, it first, The first step is getting aware yourself of what you need. I have one script, for example, that's simply about asking for respect. And it says, you know, I don't think you intend to disrespect me, and when you say these things, I feel disrespected and this is why. So you don't even have to frame it in, I want to be connected to you and have a better relationship with you. Um, you can simply say, or you can say, you know, I, these, this, this conversation about, um, or I, I find that I get um, upset or uncomfortable a lot of the time when food comes up and when conversations about food comes up. And, you know, I want you to understand why this is happening. So don't even make it about a relationship. And you can really simplify it and use words that, that work, you know, for the conversation. Okay, thank you. And my second question is, as far as group uh, relationship dynamics as con are concerned, as opposed to one-to-one, -to -one, mm -hmm. for example, groups of friends and groups of colleagues where we are generally hanging out together as opposed to one-to-one, -to -one, and we are the minority, and mm -hmm. you know, as the majority, the, the responsibility is diluted, and yeah. I was just wondering, if you have any thoughts That's another that. really good question. So if you're in a group situation, and it could even be a family as your group, you know, 
a work group situation, a family group situation, it's often useful to start out with one person who can become your ally. There's a big difference when two people take a stand on something than when it's only one person. Like the difference is actually exponential. So you can find that one person in your family or that one person in you know the organization that you think is most likely to be receptive and say, you know, this is like, can I talk to you about something? This is really hard for me. You know, when, when dad makes these comments at the table, I feel really alienated. I just can like, I, I just want you to know about this. Can you help me with this? And then you've got two people saying this isn't okay or two people requesting vegan options. So you start out with one ally at least. Okay, great, thank you very much. You're welcome. Is there another question? Thank you, I'm here. Uh, most of your talk was about what we should and shouldn't say to be more effective, and that was great. But sometimes we get to say things even when we remain silent. The other day I was with two friends and one of them wanted to offer us waffles. And, I and one of them did what? Offer us waffles. Waff what? Something with oh, eggs. Oh, waffles, okay. Waffles, mm -hmm. yeah. And I knew that if I didn't have any, and they had, they would feel judged by me because I wouldn't have had anything. So I said, okay, and the waffle wasn't even any good, but you know, and you mentioned the dinner with your family when they have meat on the table and mm. you're on the other side and they respect that, but how do you manage the fact that even, even if you don't say anything, they know that you're thinking stuff? And how do you know what they're, they're thinking? Well, they're, they're just like us. They, they know that you're vegan, so they know that, they know why you're vegan, so they, they it's, it's on their mind. It can't not be. Well, you. I mean, I would suggest that, like, I mean, they're not just like us in some ways because they're they're not vegan and they're not thinking this way. And people, it's. I think one one thing to start with is to not assume that you know what somebody else is thinking because that would be, if, even if you're not saying it, it's it's defining their reality. It's making assumptions about what's going on in somebody else's mind. You may be accurate, but you may not be accurate. They may not be thinking about it at all because they don't care because it's not on their radar and eating's not a moral issue for them. And this may be an assumption that, that you're bringing. You can also just say, I mean, Often we can just say what's true for us. You can say, you know what? Um, I don't want to have the waffle because it has eggs in it. It was a non-vegan waffle, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a non-vegan waffle. If you don't want to, you know, I don't want to have the waffle because it has, it has eggs in it. And I don't want you to think I'm being judgmental or anything. I'm not. Just say what's true for you and what's on your mind if you want to do that. Or if you really don't care and you feel like it's the lesser of evils, you can eat the waffle or you can ask somebody. You can say, you know, I, I don't want to have this waffle, but I'm worried that you're thinking something, you know, that you might be making assumptions about vegans and I don't want to make, I, I'm hoping you're not going to make those assumptions. Or you can do what I do, which is turn it into a joke. Um, you know, like, I don't want to be that stereotypical vegan in your mind, so, you know, so just say what's true for you. I mean, transparency goes a long way. A lot of the times when we feel stuck and we're not sure what we should say, sometimes just saying the truth and saying it with compassion, like often that's the best route to take. It's also the hardest route to take in some ways because um, you're being vulnerable. You're, you're showing a vulnerable part of yourself. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one or two questions. I see two hands. So these are gonna be your last two questions. Thank you for a really great presentation. Thank you. I'm just wondering, yeah, what your advice would be. I find myself often in a situation with friends and family who are, you know, partly vegetarian or on the way or they'll eat free range something. And every time I see them, you know, they want to have a conversation about, they kind of use me as a confessional in a way. Like, I ate this or I saw this or what do you think of this or what a... You know, and I just get tired of <laughs> having constant conversations about veganism and food and feeling like I'm the mm -hmm. judge and jury for other people and I don't mm -hmm. even want to be. I'm like, eat what you want, you know, like mm -hmm. I'm doing my thing, you do your thing. Like I don't even want to, I don't always feel like talking about it. I might have spent my entire day working on animal issues and advocacy and I just want to talk about politics or, you know, the weather. <laughs> just something light like politics. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, that doesn't go over very well in the US. It's like, it's easier to talk about veganism than politics at this point. Um, yeah, so there are kind of two parts to what I think you're saying. I mean, one, um, ha, you know, it might be that they're talking to you, as, using you as sort of a confession, you know, as a con the conversation is a confessional, but you don't know that for sure. Maybe they're genuinely curious and they're kind of trying to, you know, pull information out of you because they want to move further toward veganism. So I would be careful about, you know, uh, making assumptions about people's motivations unless they've stated what their motivations are. Nevertheless, many vegans have this experience where we're like tokenized, we're like the spokesperson for the entire movement, and we're not seen as people, we're reduced, you know, like a vegan is a vegan and all vegans are the same, and we're, we're tokenized. And um, again, you can do what I do in those situations and say, yeah, um, here's a great website for more information and the last thing in the world I want to talk about right now is veganism. No offense, but I do it for a living, so let's talk about Trump. No, I mean, or <laughs> something else. Just say it. You know, you can be honest and direct, and you can even honor the fact that they're curious. Like, say, you know, I'm really grateful that you have all these questions. Like, you know, because it shows that you're really curious about something that a lot of people are not curious about, and it's important. And at the same time, you know, not but, which negates what came before it, but and at the same time, I talk about veganism, veganism all day and I find it kind of draining and it's important for me to kind of separate and get away from that. I just don't want you to, and you can also share, you know, why you're uncomfortable about this. I hate saying this to you because I'm really excited about the fact that you have these questions and I don't want to ex discourage you. I'm just kind of like, I talk about it all the time, so I'd, I'd rather talk about other things. Again, being honest and direct. It seems like it's like a radical notion in the world to be honest, direct, and transparent. It's funny, but, but it is. Um, so first off, I wanted to say thank you for your thank book. You. Um, I got it at the National Animal Rights Conference. The, the book yeah. you got? Oh, good. Yeah, I got it. It was super helpful. Um, so after I, when I went vegan, um, I was like a couple months out of a psychologically abusive relationship mm -hmm. um, with a man that I later found out was a former slaughterhouse worker. Um, mm -hmm. So I was already very traumatized coming into the movement. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, your book really helped me break out of that um, through the main thing was just like establishing boundaries, uh, learning to meet my own me needs, and then also um, cultivating healthy relationships. Um, however, there's one thing uh, that you mentioned in your book, um, the idea of like the scapegoat and the black sheep. Mm -hmm. um, I'm realizing like that's where I fall in the, my family dynamic. Um, I pick up on tension. Um, that's in my family, and then um, I get like all of the blame for it. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that and how to break out of that dynamic? Yeah, um, well, seeing as I don't have three hours, maybe not, I can't do justice to it, but I'll try briefly. So what she's referring to is in my book, I, I talk about people play roles in their family systems. And one of the roles that we grow up playing or that a child in a family system can grow up playing is called the black sheep, right? This, do you guys know that word, the black sheep? It's like, you know, it's often, not always, but it's the child that's kind of an outsider. Um, my guess is that many people who become vegan played the role of the black sheep in their families. And then it's like, oh my God, and now you're vegan. Of course you are. You're the one who had to go vegan. Um, you know, so it's, it's one reason that I give as to why it can be really challenging to talk about vegan, veganism within the family system because you get kind of stuck, stuck in these roles. Um, you know, the breaking out of being aware of the role that you've played and becoming healthy yourself is really is the key. Um, you, all of these principles, as I said earlier, you know, they don't have to be practiced by everybody. You might find, what some people find, is that as they get healthier themselves, as they stop playing the role of the black sheep, as they stop going along with the game of let's pretend, see no evil, speak no evil, hear no evil, you know, let's all just stay in denial and not talk about anything and not talk about feelings, as we grow and evolve and mature, we might find that we don't fit into our family system in the same way anymore because the system isn't changing. We just are. 
And so, you know, that then then you have to really think about, you know, changing your relationships with the people in that system. Maybe it's simply that you're not as close anymore. You know, maybe you used to have that relationship with your mother where you talked about everything all the time, and now you've realized since you've grown and she wants to pull you back into that old role and that doesn't work for you, that you have to have more boundaries around that. You have more distance. You still love her. She's still your mother. Um, but you relate to her differently. You don't expect her to be able to be as authentic or connected with you as you once had before. So we can't change other people. I mean, we can try to, but we can't force other people to change. All we can do is work on ourselves and commit to practicing integrity in our relationships. And this way, those people who end up being in our inner circles are people who have the same level of, of integrity and consciousness as we have. And then we keep other people at a greater distance and that protects us from the dysfunctional dynamics. And, um, you know, and sometimes that's the best we can do. So we're out of, I can't believe I used up, I had 80 minutes. I'm like, oh, we'll have half an hour for Q&A. But here we are, done. So you guys have been wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll see you the next Thank couple you, of Melanie. days. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you.